today I will be talking about uh, decoding cell signaling networks uh, using quantitative proteomics. So before I go to really showing data, I will uh, just briefly show where I am because this center is rather new. So we moved in 2009 and that's when this uh, Center for Protein Research was established at the University of Copenhagen by a very generous donation by one foundation called Novo Nordisk Foundation and these were the very empty labs when we moved only a few people. It started but now they are all uh, fully operational. And in this talk uh, I will discuss about mass spectrometry based quantitative proteomics. So more or less everything we do, do is really quantitative um, and less often qualitative. And in particular I will uh, give you a short introduction about short -term proteomics workflow. I'm not sure if all are aware how we do things so I thought it would be good to give some general overview. Also, I will give you one or two slides about silic based quantitative proteomics uh, so that you understand how we exactly carry um, these studies. And then I will give you uh, a few examples how we applied quantitative proteomics for a systems wide decoding of signaling networks. And uh, this is uh, a cartoon diagram for short uh, proteomics, uh, and typically we start with the cells or tissues. You lyse them uh, and create a protein mixture and uh, typically either you sort or let's say dissolve your proteins on 1D SDS page or you use directly in solution. That depends on the, the choice of method but one way or other you introduce some sort of fractionation. Uh, you digest your proteins into peptides because that's exactly the end thing that you ma measure in the mass, mass spec. Uh, especially in the short gun, that's what I said. So you convert all proteins into peptides and they, that's the end species that you measure in mass spec. And if you were interested in post-translation modification, then you typically, and it's for example these uh, circles are peptides that are modified by a PTM, which is uh, a circle in this case. And those uh, peptides then you might end it to really go in-depth analysis for post-translation modification. And uh, then you have peptides which you kind of uh, separate on a chromatographic column and we use uh, electrospray ionization. You get a uh, peptide elution profile in the chromatography run indicated here. And these peptides are then uh, directly introduced to mass spectrometer and they goes to mass analyzer where the mass to charge ratio of a peptide is uh, measured. And, uh, then selected peptides are uh, fragmented in a collision cell and the masses are again analyzed in mass analyzer uh, and the spectra are recorded. And here for example I show you two different things. One is called MS spectra. That's a mass to charge ratio measurement of intact uh, peptide ions. And this gives you information about the M to G of your peptides or mass to charge ratio. And in our case, when you use silic quantitation, of course, these spectra also gives information about the relative abundance of peptides in different populations. That I will come back to you what I mean by different populations. Then selected uh, peptide ions are fragmented further and give so-called MS-MS spectra and they contain basically sequence information of your peptide so you know what peptide was present in your sample and if there was any modification. So basically these uh, both spectra help to identify peptide um, and this one particularly helps to quantify and this one helps to identify the peptide sequence and precisely map the modification site within peptide. Uh, then these uh, spectra are feeded into computer uh, database searches and they gives you back a list of peptides and group their, their according to proteins for example protein A now have four peptides that belongs to protein B has other peptides and C and so on. So you basically at the end get uh, peptides that are matched to uh, proteins uh, identified in your sample. And those uh, proteins that you can use then for further bioinformatic analysis to look for protein-protein interaction networks or pathway analysis or whatever you want to look in your data. Now um, there is large number of PTMs in cell and it is uh, estimated that eukaryotic cells uh, has nearly about 200 different type of post-translational modification. So there's a huge variety. Uh, however, not all are equally studied. Uh, some of them are more studied than others. 
And currently, for example, uh, protein phosphorylation indicated here by P is very prominently studied and well known for its regulatory role in cell signaling networks. Uh, also, role of acetylation in uh, chromatin mediated processes or some of the cy uh, cytoplasmic processes, for example, in micro microtubule function, uh, role of acetylation is also well known. Also, other PTM, for example, ubiquitin is uh, very well characterized for its function in regulating protein half-life, for example, by uh, proteasomal degradation. And there are other processes, for example, methylation, which also plays a role in uh, chromatin templated processes. So this is to highlight there is a, a wide variety of PTMs, and they regulate very diverse set of uh, cellular functions. And of course, then uh, since they are often very important control points in the cells, it is a wide interest for scientific community to first to identify where these sites occur in a whole protein. Uh, so, so to speak, uh, the map the modification sites. Also, next interest is to quantify when these sites change. So, you perturb your system and look what is the fraction of sites that change and which of those are responsive. And that may indicate you that in your uh, response to a particular perturbation, which site may be functionally important. It don't really prove it, but at least it gives uh, you an, a strong indication. So we basically are interested in both points. One, to map the sites, and second is to quantify upon certain perturbations uh, as to know out of uh, all sites which may be relevant in that particular process. And this uh, is a cartoon diagram uh, to summarize uh, that these PTMs are really core component of cell signaling networks. And I will uh, go through this slide to explain you what I want to uh, communicate from this slide. So for example, you have a well studied uh, example of receptor tyrosine kinases. They bind to their ligand on extracellular domain and get phosphorylated on intercellular domain, recruit other uh, scaffold like GRB2 or other kinases and activate so-called downstream signaling cascade, in this case, for example, PI3 kinase pathway, or here, for example, MAP kinase branch. And these are basically phosphorylation dependent signaling cascades. And this, now you can see that in this case, signal starts with a phosphorylation of certain proteins at a specific residue. However, this signal then branch out and it start using other modules, for example, uh, at later point when receptors are activated, these receptors are also endosatars to control the duration of signaling and the magnitude of signaling. And the endocytosis is also heavily relying on modification, for example, these uh, indigo dots or blue dots, uh, these are uh, ubiquitin sites, for example. So these forced lesson and ubiquitin basically <coughs> both play a role in RTK signaling. Uh, and that's just to highlight that not a single PTM, but the multiple types of PTM really get involved to process information from certain slides. And this uh, is contrary uh, for TNF-alpha receptor, for example, when you activate with the ligand, uh, it is known that the initial signal involves uh, ubiquitin, but the later on, these processes also activate kinases, for example, this uh, uh, JNK or P38 uh, MAP kinase pathway, and they involve phosphorylation. So basically, uh, one or other way, you can use different PTMs, but at the end, they probably involved uh, more than one PTMs. And uh, in this case, you can summarize that initially, this is early signaling processing event. So you have a signal uh, generation, and the signal is then uh, especially transmitted into cells to different compartments or uh, different locations. And then the signal is communicated to the nucleus. And then uh, these activated transcription factors or kinases that moves to nucleus uh, regulate transcription of important genes in these processes. And PTMs um, can regulate protein activity by different mechanism, either by directly regulating the enzymatic activity or cellular localization of proteins, or through mediating protein-protein uh, interactions. So for example, phospholysin, ubiquitin, or acetylysin, each of them, uh, when they are modified, uh, when their substrates are modified, their uh, modification, they can be specifically recognized by particular domains. For example, SS2 domains recognize uh, phosphorylated tyrosine in a specific sequence context. Similarly, these uh, domains for such as UBA or UBAN can recognize a specific 
fake uh, ubiquitin chain topologies. And for example, acetylation is then can be recognized for bromodomain or methylation by uh, uh, chromodomain or two-door domain and so on. So it basically gives uh, a way to really assemble signaling complexes and communicate uh, specific signaling events because this also gives uh, a specificity, specificity to the system. And uh, even more uh, complexity comes in the system when there is a, a PTM uh, crosstalk. For example, lysine can be modified uh, by many PTMs. So some of the PTMs can be characterized, let's say, a special uh, chemical modification, for example, acetylation, methylation, or prop propylation, uh, or for example, uh, phosphorylation or uh, serine-threonine or O-glycosylation, or phosphorylation or sulfurylation of, of tyrosine. So these are basically small chemical modification, and you can see that these residues, four of them in particularly, I mentioned here, are the most well studied and are known to be modified by more than one modification. And lysine is uh, even more typical because this is an amino acid that can be modified by polypeptide modification uh, and not just by chemical modification. And these could be like ubiquitin or sumo, NAD8 or iesculation. So this gives a huge variety of modification that can sit on this uh, amino group of lysine. And these modifications basically have a uh, potential to directly crosstalk, and that means that they may have a wide variety to integrate signal uh, in a particular uh, lysine. So that's also um, in long range, uh, we are interested to understand how the signal uh, crosstalk really is mediated at the <coughs> system's level and what is the extent of such a crosstalk. Uh, and it is known that about half of amino acid can be modified by small chemical modification, but as I said, these four are the most well studied one. And uh, lysine is the only one that can be modified by polypeptide uh, type of PTMs. And um, now I will give you uh, a role of mass spectrometry based proteomics in biological discoveries. So I will particularly focus on systems wide mapping of PP PTMs. And in particular, I will go for phosphorylation and acetylation. However, uh, recently, uh, glycosylation is also amenable to mass spec and has been studied successfully. And uh, ubiquitylation, uh, very particularly uh, last year, there were three, four different groups, and uh, they reported that now it is possible to analyze at least hundreds of ubiquitylation sites in single study. And a colleague of mine reported about 750 ubiquitylation sites uh, in a single study, which is quite a big jump. Uh, not yet uh, there compared to first lesson, but it's still a very big advance. And these are some of the examples uh, for you to really appreciate that the mass spec indeed is capable of handling a large number of PTMs. Uh, and other thing I want to en emphasize here is that different PTMs require different ways to custom enrich those samples, and that means increase the depth of analysis. So here are, for example, post-translation modification that has been uh, analyzed by mass spec uh, widely. One is force lesson, second is acid lesson, ubiquitin lesson, methyl lesson, and o glycosyl lesson. And uh, when you analyze these modifications, each of the modification, when a peptide is modified, gives a certain mass shift, and that's uh, shifted here called delta M. And this is used as a characteristic for the presence of certain PTM while you identify these uh, post translation modification in the peptides. And you use uh, certain enrichment methods to enrich modified peptides from total cell extract uh, or total cell extract peptide mixtures. And for the first lesson, most commonly used methods are uh, immobilized uh, metal affinity chromatography or uh, metal oxide chromatography, for example, titanium oxide, or antibodies, for example, for enriching phosphotyrosine-containing peptides. Because for phosphoserine and threonine, there are not very good uh, pan-specific anti antibodies uh, available so far. And these uh, uh, metal uh, oxide or um, metal-dependent chromatographies are extremely efficient method for enriching these PTMs. Uh, and in our hands, uh, far more efficient than uh, antibodies. Uh, for acetylation, uh, unfortunately, this group, uh, acetyl group, don't have a very strong chemical properties uh, that can be ex exploited for uh, 
generating such uh, chemical enrichment methods, but there are antibodies which are good enough to do a some degree of enrichment, although it is not as good as for forced lesson. Uh, and for ubiquitin lesson, uh, recently there was one antibody reported that could enrich, but it has not really been shown if it can uh, do so. I will, if you are interested, I can discuss uh, why it is difficult in particular case. But uh, instead, they used a tagged ubiquitin. So you have a ubiquitin; it is tagged with an affinity tag, either HA or GAP or flag, whatever. And then you uh, end this protein that are modified by ubiquitin by pulling down this affinity tag modified uh, uh, protein modified by this affinity tag ubiquitin. And for methylation, we again rely on antibodies. And for glycoside lesson, people often use plant lectins for enriching uh, uh, glycosylated peptides. And these are the examples for the largest studies, and this is quite an old slide, and they have really already changed, uh, so numbers are growing rapidly. For first lesson in 2010, there was a single study from my colleague, and they identified uh, 20,000 sites in a single study. And now there is already a paper where they identified nearly 36,000 sites uh, in a single study fr from mouse, mouse tissue. Uh, in acetylation, we identified 3,600 acetylation sites, and that's still the largest uh, so far. And for ubiquitin lesson, there are already more than 700 sites in single listed in human cells. For methylation, numbers are not that impressive, but that's still the largest one. And for all group lesson also, numbers are increasing rapidly. And these are comments then that are, there are certain benefits or certain uh, caveats in terms of analyzing. For example, uh, ubiquitin lesson, uh, there are certain not really this uh, mass shift from chemical shift, but they have a diglycin when you uh, trips and cleavage with a peptide. So it's usually lysine uh, in the protein is modified by ubiquitin and when you leave your peptides with the trypsin, it leaves to glycine at the site of modification. And they are used then as a kind of a tag to know which site was indeed modified. And then, uh, yeah, I think it's uh, the same slide. And now I will leave, uh, give you an example how we have used uh, these tools to decipher signaling uh, downstream of uh, receptor tires and kinases. And here I will give you an example for compartment specific uh, signaling by oncogenic FLT3 receptor. This is apparently a mis uh, misspelling. And uh, before going to these uh, mass specific data, I would like to give an overview what this FLT3 receptor is. So this is a receptor tyrosine kinase, particularly expressed in uh, hematopoietic uh, cells. And um, this receptor tyrosine kinase is mutated in a hematological disease called acute myeloid leukemia. And in that particular disease, about one third of patients have a mutation in this gene. And that makes this to be the most frequently mutated kinase in this uh, acute myeloid leukemia disease. And the receptor consists of two parts, basically this extracellular domain containing five IgG-like IgG -like domains, and then intercellular do kinase domain, which is split in two domains, N-terminal kinase domain and C-terminal kinase domain. And then there is a loop called JM or juxta membrane uh, loop because it's close to plasma membrane, and the other loop is called activation loop uh, region, which controls activation of the kinase. And the mutation in this uh, receptor tyrosine kinase are clustered in two particular regions. One is in this juxta membrane region, and the second are in this activation loop. And they have different properties because these mutations are often insertion of amino acids in tandem. So you have the same amino acid, like five amino acids or seven amino acids, that are just inserted in frame. So the receptor is full length encoded, but you have certain amino acids that are inserted. And that's where they uh, call it inter tandem, internal tandem duplications, or ITD. A second type of mutations are activation loop mutation, where one of the residues in activation loop region is substituted by the other residue. And that also lead to autoactivation of the receptor. So the bottom line is that the both of the receptors are autoactivating. Once the receptor is mutated, it is activated ind independent of the ligand. And that means it's a constitutively active and supposed to be important for its oncogenic transforming abilities. 
Now, uh, what was known about this receptor uh, from the group where I did my PhD and also from uh, the group from Japan, that activation of aberrant signaling by this mutant receptor called FLD3 ICD, that's the type of mutation I indicated just a minute ago. It is known that if you have this FLD3 wild type receptor, it binds to ligand, it dimerizes, and it activates uh, classical signaling pathways, for example, MAP kinase or PI3 kinase pathway. If you have a mutation in this receptor indicated by these two stars, then you even don't need a ligand to activate the receptor, but it's activated independent of the ligand, and then it activates pathways similar to wild type, for example, MAP kinase and PI3 kinase pathway. But it is well documented that this receptor particularly activates a transcription factor called STAT5, and that uh, upregulates downstream uh, genes, for example, PIM1 and 2 kinases and SOX proteins. So this is a signaling branch which is typically only activated by the mutant but not by the wild type. However, the cause of such an aberrant activation of a specific signaling branch by this mutant receptor was not known. So we, inter we were interested why this receptor might really activate this different type of signaling because uh, it was clear that it don't really alter this, the substrate specificity of kinase but there is something else that really leads to aberrant signaling. So we asked one question, and um, that was that receptor might give different type of signaling from different cellular compartments. And just to uh, bring all of uh, you on the same page, uh, first I will go through the itinerary of receptor ties in kinase signaling uh, or kinase trafficking. So as all of you know, that uh, transmembrane uh, proteins are synthesized on endoplasmic reticulum, uh, indicated here, here on the ER. And they are partially glycosylated here, indicated by blue dots. These receptors are then trafficked to Golgi, where they are further glycosylated, so-called mature glycosylation. From Golgi, they are uh, trafficked to the plasma membrane, where they bind to their ligand indicated in the stars. And this ligand binding then leads to dimerization of the receptor. And depending on the extent of the signal and the duration, receptor may be internalized, it may get degraded or it may be recycled to plasma membrane. Now that's the case for the wild type normal receptor. In case of mutant, things are different. So as I indicated that the mutant even don't need a ligand for activation. So we um, from uh, classical Western blotting um, experiments, we figured out that the, our mutant receptor was indeed activated inside the cell much before it reaches the plasma membrane. So that means the mutant receptor was activated certain compartments where wild type receptor has no way to get activated. And that is not possible for wild type because it needs certain requirements to get activated at the cell surface. So then we ask, is there a role of these compartments in the signaling? It is well documented that these compartments which play a role in endocytosis, a receptor signaling can continue from these endocytic compartments However, the role of these biosynthetic compartments in RTK signaling was not really well studied. And to ask that question, we used a rather a crude approach and used a drug called Brifeldin A, which is very unspecific drug, which basically disintegrates Golgi complex and blocks the trafficking of the receptors to the plasma membrane. And that is a very unspecific, I must mention. It is not specific to this receptor, but all receptors which require Golgi <coughs> for trafficking, that means majority of the receptor, everything will be trafficked back to endoplasmic reticulum. That's a well known pheno phenomenon. And we use that phenomenon to study that once we block this, then we can look type of signaling that emanates from here and compare to the receptor which is located both at the plasma membrane and endoplasmic to see what kind of signal it might generate. So I will uh, not show all data, but basically I can uh, uh, say here is that what we found that the STAT5, for example, was very robustly activated when the receptor was kept at intercellular compartments, but MAP kinase signaling and AKT signaling was very much abolished. And when we left receptor go membrane, we saw the contrary, that STAT5 activation was diminished, but the MAP kinase and PI3 kinase signaling was increased, suggesting that uh, the receptor differential signaling really comes from these different cellular compartments. And to look that phenomenon on, the, on a global scale, we use uh, silac based uh, quantitative mass spectrometry. And this is uh, a cell line called 32D, 
these are uh, myeloid progenitor mouse cell line and widely used uh, for studying signaling events um, by hematopoietic uh, receptor tyrosine kinases. And we label these SILAC with a different amino acids, for example, arginine or lysine. And this is arginine and lysine, which contain uh, carbon 12. So that's what everybody uses. Uh, so they always contain uh, carbon 12. That's the most stable isotope. Or we use arginine and lysine that contains um, arginine 6. That means six atoms of uh, carbon 13 or four atoms of deuterium instead of hydrogen or we use arginine 10 and lysine 8. Basically these are different uh, stable isotopes and that should remind that they are not radioactive at all and very safe to work. Uh, but in mass spec these isotopes can be easily distinguished. So when you grow cells, uh, cells cannot discriminate between these uh, isotope encoded amino acids but in mass spectrum since they have a different molecular weight um, uh, due to carbon uh, length in the uh, or the atomic comp composition of amino acids, they can be distinguished. So you can know from which pop cell population you were looking for your peptides. So then we label these three different uh, cell populations. And in this case, uh, we took this transgene expression. So either we use a vector control, that means cells even don't express this receptor, or we transfect cells with this mutant receptor or cells that were treated with the mutant re receptor, they were treated with the befeldin A, so that the receptor was kept only inside. So in this case, for example, what happens is that you have no receptor specific signaling, so you have no background signaling in the cells. In the second case, you have mutant receptor, so the signaling you can see what is really mutant specific uh, and what is distinct from this background. And then in third condition, you have befeldin A. So you can see what signaling differs between this condition and this condition must be the signaling that is really different from plasma membrane versus the endoplasmic reticulum or from biosynthetic compartments. In the second experiment, we um, took an approach where we expressed this receptor in all three conditions. But in first condition, we inhibited receptor activity by using a well-known chemical inhibitor. So that basically again serves as the control because receptor activity bit is inhibited and that means signaling is not activated. And when you compare from this medium cell population, we know that what kind of signaling is receptor specific and what is activated from the endoplasmic reticulum. And then we mix these cell ligates and uh, uh, enriched phos phosphorylated peptide using titanium oxide chromatography and analyzed by <coughs> mass spec. Now, um, if you are not all familiar with the silic based quantitation, basically what you do is you have your peptides which comes for example in this case uh, light uh, cell population, in this case from medium and in this case from heavy. And you compare their peptide intensities when the intensities for example in this case here, here and here, they look almost equal. That means there are no change, first lesson of this peptide is equal in all three cell populations. Now if you look for other e examples for example in this case, you see that this particular phosphorylated peptides from uh, kinase P90 RSK1 was phosphorylated only in case of mutant receptor. It was not phosphorylated in the control cells or phosphorylation was increased in other words. And this increase was brought down when you keep receptor intercellularly. On the other side, there are examples where receptor, for example, phosphorylation of uh, a molecule called acin one is increased by the receptor and it's even further increased if you put refilled in A. <laughs> And if you quantify by, by Western blot, this is how you would look. So it's really very similar to what you see in the Western blot and what you see in mass spec. Just basically, rather than looking these uh, band intensities, you look at the intensity profile of your isotope patterns. And that's, uh, you can see, really simple to quantify once you have identified peptides uh, with the nice intensities. And now we can use these profile to really look what kind of overall signaling generates. And in this case, uh, I um, would mention that we uh, quantified about 12,000 phosphorylation sites and look for their profile, how they were regulated. Yeah. And this is to summarize the overall results, what we found or what was the major thing. So we found that uh, PA3 kinase and MAP kinase signaling pathways are activated from the membrane. And these components which are depicted here, each of them were identified and quantified and quantified on the sites which most of you may have used even antibodies from 
other companies to look for the activation specific antibodies. So these marks are exactly what people have been using and that's what exactly we quantify. And that told us that this PA3 kinase signaling pathway branch is really activated from membrane, MAP kinase signaling branch is activated from uh, membrane as well. But the STAT5 activation is really happening at the endoplasmic reticulum. And we also figured out that the STAT5 goes to nucleus and then these PIM kinases are activated and we found a large number of substrates or putative substrate I must say, uh, which are target of PIM kinases. And that we could figure out because PIM kinases apparently have a very specific uh, sequence motif in which uh, context they phosphorylate their substrates. So you can look for the sequence, uh, sequences surrounding the phosphorylation sites and infer which kinases may be responsible for their phosphorylation. And by that uh, way we could figure out that these possible substrates are PIM substrates. So for example, one, two and three, these with the uh, direct uh, black arrow or solid black arrows, they are known substrates and these dotted arrows, we think they are also the novel substrates of PIM kinases. In addition, there were a large list of substrates, but I didn't mention them all here. Now I will switch gears uh, from first lesson and go to acetylation. Um, and that's where a uh, major focus of my group is uh, right now. Um, and that's because um, when I went to um, do my postdoc, I realized that there were really not um, very good mass spec approaches uh, to really look site specific uh, changes in acetylation on a systems wide level. So we could do for a few sites with antibodies, but also as you may know, there are very few antibodies available for acetylation compared to phosphorylation and that was a limiting thing. And we thought if we could do something to really um, get this system analyzed a bit better by mass spec. And why lysine acetylation interesting? Uh, lysine acetylation is a reversible force translation modification like phosphorylation. It is catalyzed uh, what is classically known uh, heads, for example, histone acetyl transferases. Now they are also uh, renamed and called lysine acetyl transferases because we now know that histones are not the only substrates and it is probably a misnomer to call them histone acetyl transferases because they are possibly better to call them lysine acetyl transferases. And uh, this acetyl group is then removed by histone deacetylases called HDAC or by lysine deacetylases now called KDEX. And these enzymes, um, histone acetyl transferases and uh, deacetylases are highly evolutionary conserved, present even from bacteria uh, to human. And in uh, human, for example, there are uh, different subclasses of HDACs. And here I illustrate so-called zinc dependent classical HDACs and there are 11 in human genome. And if you look at the phenotypes of uh, knockout mice, uh, many of them have a, a strong phenotype suggesting that the genes play an important role in mammalian physiology. And that means that substrate, identifying their substrates would be probably uh, interesting to broad scientific community. Also, lysine deacetylase are interesting therapeutic targets. Uh, for example, there is one drug uh, called this Zaha. Uh, this is approved for, to treat uh, CTCL, so that's a cutaneous T cell lymphoma, so it's a very specific hem uh, hematopoietic disease. However, it shows proof of principle that this deacetylase uh, inhibitor could be of therapeutic use. And the other ones which I indicate here, many of those are in clinical trials to see their efficacy in treating various types of diseases. And uh, as I said, it's, it's an important regulatory PTM and from uh, already uh, in the literature, it is well known that acetyl play uh, a key role in regulating many cellular processes, including DNA damage repair, regulation of gene expression by modification of histone tails, or in protein folding and degradation, uh, in cytoskeleton reorganization, and recently it emerged that it play an important role in memory and aging. So we decided to uh, look this uh, lysine acetylation in a more quantitative fashion and used a silic based quantitative approach very similar to what I uh, introduced to you a few slides earlier. And we used three different human cell lines. So this is hematopoietic cell line called MV411 or A549 uh, or Jukart cells. Uh, and these cells were basically labeled with a, a silic or in some cases we did initial pilot experiment where we even didn't use SILAC to test whether we could get this method working. 
and when we saw that method is really working, then we introduced Silac to see um, if these acetylation sites change in the response to two of the chemical inhibitors for lysine deacetylases. One is called MS275, that is in clinical trials, and the other one is Zaha, which I indicated is used in the clinics. And they compared the acetylation of these two cell populations with the cells that are controlled, uh, treated with uh, vehicle, for example, DMSO. And we did this experiment with three, three cell types. So it looks a bit complex scheme, but you can focus on one of them and see that this is really the same scheme applied for other cell types. We mixed these cells, prepare cell ligate, uh, did so-called in solution digest. That's basically you have all protein in a solution and you digest in, in that solution and not running a gel. That is called in solution digestion. And from this uh, um, peptide mixture, we did anti-acetyl lysine uh, peptide IP. So that means we did immunoprecipitation, but at the peptide level, not at the protein level. And those peptides were then uh, either were not fractionated and directly analyzed uh, by LCMS, or they were fractionated using isoelectric focusing, and then were run on LTQ orbital mass spectrometer and identified and quantified using MaxQuant software. And this is an overview of the acetylated proteins. Uh, so we identified about 1,750 <laughs> proteins in three different cell lines altogether. And we identified about 3,600 3, acetylene sites in these uh, studies. And this uh, was quite uh, a significant increase compared to so when we started this study. Altogether in literature, there were about 600 sites known in everywhere we could collect. So it almost expanded all lysine acetylase sites by almost sixfold. So that we think uh, is quite valuable. The one of the properties we notice for these uh, lysine acetylase acetylated proteins is that acetylation is quite prevalent modification on macromolecular complexes. For example, if you look at the lysine acetyl transferases, so this is on top are uh, the lysine acetyl transferase complexes, for example, TIP60 uh, hat. And this has various subunits which are indicated below in these circles. And each of circle has uh, some of these dots. And each dot represents a unique acetylation site. When dot is blue, that means these sites were already known in the literature. When dot is red, that means to our knowledge, these sites were not known in the literature. And this gives you an overview that there were very few uh, subunits which were known to be acetyl acetylated and their sites were mapped. And our data. Uh, vastly increase the number of uh, acetylated lysines on these uh, complexes. And this was not limited to uh, lysine acetyl transferase complexes, but also other complexes, for example, chromatin remodeling or deacetylase complexes, transcriptional regulation complexes, or methyl transferases, ubiquitin ligases, deubiquitinases. So this is to just to highlight there were diverse variety of protein subclasses or that were modified by uh, lysine acetylation, suggesting that the lysine acetylation may play a much broader regulatory role uh, and not limited to chromatin templated processes where it was already known to play a major role. And when we look at these proteins and their uh, known role in certain biological processes, for example, large number of proteins, these were known to play a role in uh, DNA damage repair, and the colored ones are here in pink are proteins which are acetylated in our study but not known previously to be acetylated and the ones that are in gray were known to be acetylated previously. And if you look at the cell cycle again, the picture is similar that only there were few gray proteins that were known to be acetylated and now our data further expand the regulatory role in these processes uh, and also for example RNA splicing, it appears that uh, a large number of splicing proteins are acetylated but only very few are known to be um, or have a known role in terms of uh, regulating the activity. When we look at the domain structure of proteins which are acetylated, uh, many of those have significantly enriched domains which are present on nuclear proteins, for example, these RNA recognition or helicase domain, PhD finger which bind to methylated lysine and so on. Uh, and that suggested that this indeed is uh, prominent in the nucleus, but we also saw a large number of uh, proteins involved in uh, cellular compartments which are outside of nucleus, for example, uh, in cytoplasm. And um, the next slide shows that acetylation of CDC28 in the yeast 
and the human homolog, this is called CDC2, uh, impairs its function. So we found that the acetylation uh, of CDC2 was present on uh, lysine residue, which is important uh, for its activity. And when we mutated that residue, so this is uh, in CDC28, it's called K20. And when you mutate this lysine to uh, glutamine, which is uh, supposed to mimic the acetylation, then uh, this yeast lost its property to grow, uh, to grow. And when you mutate this to arginine, uh, this also uh, cannot really grow, but the wild type CDC28 can grow, suggesting that these acetylation may play a role in regulating this kinase activity. And we also f uh, validated the site was even acetylated in the yeast protein. Other thing we also saw was that uh, proteins called 1433 were acetylated on uh, different residue, for example, lysine 50, 70, or these two, so lysine 115 and 120. And in human genome, there are seven 1433 uh, proteins. And of, unfortunately, all of them don't have a unique peptide that mass sphere can quantify. But as far as we could see presence of unique peptides, it would appear that all seven proteins are modified on these analogous residues. Uh, and that suggested that this may play a wider role in terms of regulating these 1433 protein. And 1433 proteins are basically adapter protein which recognize phosphorylated serine threonine. And that means they are phosphorylation dependent signaling mediators. And this uh, acetylation data suggested that the acetylation may have a crosstalk with the phosphorylation dependent signaling and may regulate 1433. Um, binding with the uh, phosphoheptide. So it is well, as I said, it's well known that this 1433 bind to a phosphorylated peptide and there is a well mapped phosphorylation site on a RAF1 kinase and this peptide we use in a peptide pull down assay. So we, we took a peptide and saw whether this peptide and 1433 can interact or not and what is the importance of these residues. So in this case, you can see wild type can interact with the peptides when you mutate this to um, glutamine this um, significantly impairs the binding with the phosphopeptide, but when you mutate with arginine, this activity is, is still there. When you have this um, 70, uh, lysine 70 mutated, it don't have an effect. And when you mutate uh, three of these residue, this lysine 50 and these two together, it almost abolishes the binding with the phosphopeptide, suggesting that acetylation may impair the binding of 1433 with the phosphorylated uh, proteins. So um, I would like to summarize that uh, modern high resolution mass spectrometry has emerged as a powerful tool for large scale PTM analysis. And quantitative proteomics can deliver highly accurate information about changes in proteomes and PTMs on a global scale. And silic based proteomics is widely used for proteome wide decoding of signaling <laughs> networks uh, for a reason that it is uh, quite simple to do. And the other thing is also it's a it's very accurate or one of the most accurate uh, method to analyze relative changes in PTMs and proteomes, at least in cell culture uh, systems. And large scale proteomic data sets provide a systems view of signaling uh, networks and hopefully provide uh, a rich information for many of the biologists to really understand the functional significance of the proteins and PTMs that change upon certain perturbations. Uh, with this, I would like to acknowledge uh, people in my group who did work. Uh, Sebastian Wagner, really, he's an excellent postdoc working on a DNA damage repair pathway uh, together with the Petra. And uh, Brian works on acetylation, and Eddie is working also on acetylation. Uh, and of course, Matthias Mann and uh, people from his group who initially helped me to really get uh, to learn mass spec and do some of the uh, work in his group, and also my uh, former supervisor for PhD, who continued to support and provide reagents for doing some of the studies uh, with the hematopoietic receptor ties and kinase signaling. And uh, I would also like to generously acknowledge uh, the funding from the uh, very generous funding from Novo Nordisk to establish this new protein center. We are also supported by two of the seventh framework EU grants, Cybos and Prime Access, and by um, large number of other funding agencies uh, to our postdoc fellow or to us, for example, Sebastian is funded by DFG and uh, Danish Research Council, Ed is funded by Swedish Research Council, and so on. And I would like to take also opportunity to announce that we also have 
PhD and postdoc uh, opportunities. So if you feel motivated to come, you are welcome to apply. And thank you very much.